there is grandeur in this view of life. Welcome to Evolution Talk with Rick Coast, an introduction to the oldest story ever told. In 2013, a South African cave system was found to be hiding a secret. Now, this secret had been hidden there for hundreds of thousands of years, and it was discovered two years ago. It's events such as these that make me happy to be alive today. In the last century, there have been so many monumental discoveries and advancements that it boggles the mind, both in our knowledge and our technology. Now, this one we can toss into the knowledge camp, and it's one of my favorites since it helps us to understand ourselves even though we don't know exactly what it is that's been found, or even how old it is. To help me explain it, I have with me today a return guest. I am Stephanie Keep. I work for the National Center for Science Education, among other places. Stephanie has been following this story from the very moment it was announced. She's also written about it on the NCSE blog. Needless to say, she was thrilled when the announcement came in. But I still haven't told you what was found yet, have I? I'll let Stephanie explain it, as well as how it all went down. You'll love this. Uh, so it was found back in, in 2013. So this is all really recent. The, the discovery was announced on September 10th of this year, 2015. And everything has happened in two years, which is crazy fast for paleontology. And I think we'll probably end up talking more about that later. Um, but back in 2013, there were a couple of cavers. And I learned, by the way, that it's cavers, not spelunkers. I've always called them spelunkers, and so my apologies to those cavers who are listening. I had no idea. So, these cavers were... Uh, we're exploring this system of caves. It's known as the Rising Star Cave System, and it's in South Africa, uh, you know, 20 or so miles northwest of Johannesburg. And these guys were kind of feeling like they're going to take the path less traveled. This area is known as the Cradle of Mankind. People, or cavers to be more appropriate, have been darting in and out of the Rising Star cave system since the 1960s. Now, as with many of these underground systems, you'll find some pretty tight spaces. And on September 13th, 2013, two members of the Speleological Exploration Club of South Africa, and try saying that three times fast, they decided to spend the day exploring Rising Star. The cavers in question, there were two of them, had to go through 80 meters of twisting and turning tunnels where they eventually ran into a vertical chimney. Now this chimney even has a name. It's called Superman's Crawl because you have to like put one arm up over your head and like the other one behind you to let, I mean, just crazy. And then you climb up this really steep thing called Dragon's Back and then you're in this tiny chute that drops you down. If you're feeling a little claustrophobic listening to this, it's almost over. Once they got to this chute at the top of the Dragon's Back, they had to reassess their position. The way I'm imagining this is, is these two guys, these cavers standing at the top of the chute, playing perhaps a game of rock, paper, scissors to decide who goes down first. Oh, and I should give you their names, especially considering what they found at the bottom. Their names are Rick Hunter and Steven Tucker. So once it was decided who would go first, at least I would want to have the chance to decide, they landed 30 meters into this chamber called the Dinaletti Chamber. Sounds like uh, like Indiana Jones. You expect like one of those rocks to start rolling after you. And... It would be Indiana Jones, but I don't think Indiana Jones's hat would fit through these right. passages. <laughs> <laughs> right. um, so these guys, these two cavers, they found themselves in this chamber and realized that it was like straight out of some horror movie, a chamber of bones. There were bones, there were everywhere, bones everywhere, 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 everywhere. Bones everywhere. Now, have you ever seen the movie The Descent? All I could think when I first heard this story is, I hope these cavers never saw the movie. In the movie, there's these creatures that, well, never mind, I don't want to spoil it for you. So needless to say, in the movie, things don't go well. Luckily for us and these two cavers, things turned out very well. When they saw the bones, they didn't freak out. They knew pretty much what to do. And why did they know what to do? Lee Berger, who's a paleoanthropologist, um, when the university is in South Africa, he has sort of put a word out to cavers to, if you ever see any bones, to let him know. And so word got back to him, He um, and then he pulled a team together. So 
How did he pull his team together? Well, he turned to an age-old communications tool with a wide reach, Facebook. And I just so happened to have tracked down that original post from October 2013. In it, he says he's looking for individuals with excellent archaeological and excavation skills for a short-term project that may kick off as early as November 1, 2013. He also adds that there's a catch. The person must be skinny and preferably small. They can't be claustrophobic, they must be fit, and they should have some caving experience. I wonder how many people he got to answer that. 57! Really? Yes! Good for him. Wow. So, with 57 potential cavers willing to take part in this mystery project, he narrowed it down to six women. They're known as the underground astronauts. For three weeks, the underground astronauts passed Bones back, from the chamber, up the chute, over Dragon's back, and through Superman's crawl. They only excavated a tiny portion. I think all of it was excavated from like one meter, something impossibly small. And from that square one meter space, they managed to collect enough bones to represent approximately 15 individuals. Think about that for a moment, and it will give you an idea just how many bones are in the Dinaletti chamber. They represent all ages and genders. So you've got very old, the elderly, and you've got infants, and you've got males, and you've got females. I mean, it's a population which is really just an incredible opportunity for the scientists studying him. Now that he had plenty of specimens to start with, thanks to his team of astronauts, Professor Berger could now begin the painstaking task of examining them. He could have done this alone. I know that would have been my first inclination. After all, ancient bones, right? But Professor Berger is no normal paleoanthropologist. Everything he's done is a little bit renegade, and this was no exception. He, instead of doing what most paleontologists do, which is to sort of like protect your find and painstakingly analyze it for years and years and years before publishing it, he put out a call, basically, and gathered specialists to come for like a powwow. And I love that. He crowdsourced the analysis of his discovery. This guy is cutting edge. So what did Professor Berger and his team of energetic young specialists conclude? They concluded that what they had was, was indeed a new species, um, and they named it Homo naledi. Homo naledi. Not cannibalistic underground cave dwellers from a horror movie. And not the bones of an unfortunate group of miners or spelunkers. A new species. Something that apparently hadn't been seen before, according to Professor Berger and his team. By comparing the traits found in the bones with that of known early hominin populations and modern humans, they realized that what they had could potentially change everything. What are some of the traits that, that told him he had a different species or possibly a different species? So it's, it's all very interesting and strange. So one of the most remarkable things about it is it has a very small brain. So paleoanthropologists measure brain size by a sort of, obviously the brain is long decayed, it's gone, but you can sort of look at the brain, the, the skull and measure its volume. And that gives you an idea of how big the brain was. And for context, a, a modern human adult brain is somewhere in the range of about 1,300 to 1,500 cubic centimeters. So just how small are the brains of the individuals found in the cave? Bird brains are about the size of a, you know, a, a good-sized orange, somewhere more in the, I think the estimate is 465 cubic centimeters for the females and about 560 for the males. So small, almost a third of the size of our brains. But that's not all. There are other differences as well, like the foot. The foot of Homo naledi is apparently so similar to our own foot that one of the researchers said if you had just come across that in a cave, you would decide you would have thought that some Bushman had just died. And the teeth? Some of the uh, the teeth and the jaw seem very Homo-like. And what about the hips? And there's some bits of the hips. The bottom of the hips in particular are very Homo-like. I really like that description, Homo-like. It's sort of like us, but not quite like us. But then there's other things that are a little bit 
less homo-like. Besides its small brain, its shoulder blades were, were short and, and placed high and wide on its body. There are other certain aspects of its teeth and its hips. It's all, it's a mosaic is the word that gets used a lot and it's very appropriate, that it's a mix of these traits. But putting it all together, Berger and his team gave it the designation of homo, and they think it's a very basal homo, which means a homo that a homo species that's really close to the origin of our genus. If Professor Berger and his team are right, then what they are holding in their hands might just be one of our earliest ancestors of the homo genus. This is not to be confused with the great split. At that split, the common ancestor between us and chimpanzees broke off into two groups and went their separate ways. Now this split happened about five to six million years ago. Anything on our side of the split is a hominin. And what exactly is a hominin? So a hominin is anything, any organism, any species that is more closely related to us, modern human beings, than they are related to modern chimpanzees. And before you ask, we are not the only homo species to have enjoyed our time under the sun. There are several other homo species that have lived, and at one time a bunch of the different homo species lived at the same time. We know that uh, homo sapiens interbred with homo uh, neanderthalensis, um, and that's just one. There's a lot of other homo species as well. And now we have one more, homo naledi. So here we have this cave, an extremely difficult cave to get to, Almost impossible, if you ask me, since I'm not a caver. And remember Professor Berger's Facebook request for specialists. You not only needed to be a caver, you also needed to be a thin caver. A highly specialized thin caver. If you haven't wondered already, I'll ask the question. How exactly did these bones get there? When I first heard about this, I thought the answer had to be predators. I imagined some saber-toothed cat, or maybe a cave bear, a very thin cave bear, dragging the bodies into its lair to eat. But there's no teeth marks. On any of the bones, so that's one thing. There's no sign of a recent trauma to the bones at all. And the other thing that I find most compelling, because I had, well, probably because I hadn't thought about it, and when someone said it, I was like, oh, yeah, is that there's no other bones in there besides Homo naledi. There's almost nothing else. So the bones found in the cave are almost exclusively Homo naledi bones. Maybe a small rodent or two mixed in, but those are just snacks. Hominin would have been the main course. For the predator hypothesis to be true, you have to get a predator that hunted almost, only Homo naledi nothing else, and managed to drag them back to its cave without putting a mark on them. So maybe things were different back in the day. Back in the day being thousands or hundreds of thousands of years ago when they were first placed there, or died there. So this Superman's crawl that you referenced earlier, and the, what was the other one, the dragon's back? Dragon's back, yeah. So this, this all probably was there then. Yeah, they think that it could have been that it could have been a little bit wide. Superman's crawl might have been a little wider. Things might have been slightly shift, but there's no evidence that it was, you know, suddenly formed um, in any way. So it was, an, it was tricky to get there. So it seems deliberate. Exactly. So there are a couple of scenarios there. Where, did they live in this cave? Maybe they live there, but there's no signs of habitation whatsoever. There's no tools. There's no, there's no nothing, no remnants of food, no nothing. So then you're left with, were they deliberately placed there after they died? And that leads one to all sorts of conclusions of possibilities and questions. First question, of course, is why? Second would be how? And third, well, remember what Stephanie said earlier. This species, the Homo naledi, had very small brains. But if they're placing their dead you know, in a centralized uh, cave that, that's not easy to navigate, then there's a reason behind that. Exactly. So this is showing some real higher order thinking. Higher order thinking in small brains. It sort of makes you rethink the notion that intelligence is linked to large brains or brain to body ratios. Now, if I'm pushing myself through a dark cave to leave a body and not one I plan to eat, then I have reason for doing so. One that I thought of or was told to do. So unless we are looking at one of the very first serial killers, we're stuck with trying to figure out why. Now, it's not funereal or ritualistic. They are just bones. There's nothing to suggest any sort of ritual behind it. 
my favorite answer to this, I have a really, I have a good friend, Brianna Pobiner, who's at the Smithsonian. And she pointed out to me that dead bodies smell and smells attract predators. If you get rid of your dad, move them somewhere far away, then you aren't going to be attracting the predators. I have to admit, I like this hypothesis also. It doesn't take a rocket scientist, nothing against the homo and the letty here, but it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that the dead attracts predators. A few tigers hanging around the camp to get at the bodies, and you might quickly figure out the need to distance yourself from them. Both the bodies and the tigers, that is. And lucky for you, there just happens to be a cave nearby, a dark cave. Oh, and this cave, this dark cave, it's a funhouse ride of twists and turns, and Superman's crawl. Now, getting to the Dinaletti chamber could have been luck once, but getting to it over and over again? The researchers determined that the chamber was never open to the surface. There's simply no evidence there to support that, so it was always hard to get to. And if the Homo Naledi were getting to it over and over again to leave bodies, one would assume they had to have known their way. But it's not like they could just flip a light switch. Could they have used, dare I say it, torches? I'm assuming they've done this, but I'll ask it the question anyway, is if they did use fire, would there be signs? Would there be charred, you know, maybe scrapes on a wall or? Yes, and they haven't found any. The way you described the cave, and I'm assuming that, um, what, were the, what was the team called again? The Underground Astronauts. They, I'm sure they had tons so of they lights. They had a lot of they lights. Had, every, you know, as, as much you know, safety gear as possible. And, and it was still a treacherous journey to get to that cave. These guys, the Homo Naledi, had, had they do nothing. It? I know. So the how remains a mystery. But what about the when? We know the cave is very old. Some geologists estimate it as being as much as 3 million years old, and that's old. That's not to say the Homo Naledi were around and dumping their dead there for all that time. Not even close. But can we tell how long? Unfortunately, we can't. We might not even be able to get close. It's not like the bones are date stamped. We can try to put a date on the bones by carbon dating, but that only goes back so far. Plus, there is another concern with doing that. That would entail taking some of the bones and I'm assuming crushing them. It would. So there's a couple things about it. So carbon-14 is something you can use to date um, organic material. So a bone would work, but it's only good to about 50,000 years old. If it's older than that, you're not going to get anything back. And you're right, you have to destroy it. So there was a lot of the the researchers took some criticism for not at least trying to do it. So at the very least they could establish, we know that they're older than 50,000 years. But they said that they didn't want to do that because you'd have to destroy the bone. And they did they want to make sure that the bones were all cataloged and described before they did that. Most fossils when they are found are dug up. Those ones we have an easier time with when it comes to dating. And the way we know is by getting dates of certain rock layers above and below where that fossil was found. So the only rocks that can give you an accurate date in terms of how old how old is this rock is our rocks called igneous rocks, which are formed from lava and magma. Things would be a whole lot easier if the bones had been embedded in the rock, but they aren't. They are scattered loosely throughout the cave. Even if the entire cave was lined with igneous rocks, even littered with them, All we know is that the bones were dumped there. It's like leaving a hamburger in an old castle. You can date the castle, but not how long the hamburger has been sitting there. So it seems we have more questions than we have answers when it comes to the Homo Naledi. But remember, it's only been two years. The bones were discovered in 2013. It might take years to fill in some of the gaps. And some of them will remain gaps. For those, we can only offer educated guesses. But our knowledge is growing, and that's the thing about knowledge. We sometimes think that we are the only species with the ability to accumulate knowledge. As a result, we tend to think of ourselves as special, or more evolved. We tend to forget that we weren't here first, nor have we been around the longest. These species were probably around a lot longer than our species have been around. We're a really young species. I just think it's not very wise of us. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> to make any sort of suggestion that they weren't well evolved. All species are very well evolved. No species is better than another. It, we all have what it takes to survive or else we wouldn't be here. So being able to walk long distances on two feet, being able to have fine motor skills, and this evidence of this highly developed social behavior is all 
indicative and actually we could actually say social structure too because it's you know they're clearly this is a population they were all living together so this is a very what we would think of as a highly evolved you know social structure and you've got you know the the being able to walk long distances being able to you have fine motor skills all these things clearly one thing we can tell for absolute certain not dependent on having a big brain So, we will continue to look at the evidence, offer suggestions, and try to fill in the gaps. Sometimes we'll succeed, and other times we'll fail. The thing is, there will always be questions. And the answers aren't cleanly cut pieces of a jigsaw puzzle either. The pieces we have to work with have funny shapes, and they don't always fit together. We know this, and we also know not to force them together. All we can do is put them next to each other, stand back, and hope a picture begins to emerge. We're a mixture and, and evolution's messy and we only get, fossils just give us snapshots. We're missing a lot of data. We're missing a lot of information. And so, you know, we do the best we can. And the more we learn, the messier it gets, but that's what makes it interesting. This episode would not have been possible without Stephanie Keep and her limitless wealth of knowledge. Thank you, Stephanie. And you really should check out her work. She has written an excellent piece on the Homo Naledi, which I will link to in the show notes. You can find her articles in a number of places, but the perfect place to start is the NCSE blog at ncse.com slash blog. You can also reach out to Stephanie via Twitter at Keeps3. As far as the Homo Naledi, if you have access to a 3D printer, you can actually go online to download free plans of the bones and the skulls so you can print your own. It's amazing stuff. And I'll link to where you can download these plans in the show notes. Now, as always, you can help the show by sharing the show. Tell your friends about it. And if you want to help keep the show chugging along, if you're a patron of the arts, please consider supporting the show at evolutiontalk.com support. The music on today's episode was composed by two talented musicians, Kevin McLeod and Chad Crouch. Now I'm Rick Coast, and until next time, please take care of yourself. Evolution Talk is a Rick Coast production.